Alternate history at its core is about imagining something different. And as this channel's community has grown over the couple years, there is a few defining things I know we all like. Countries, history, and flags. And especially alternate versions of all of those. An alternate country is an imagining of a fictional country that doesn't exist. A fictionalized place either slightly different or far different than the nations of our timeline. A while back, yes, I know, a way while back, I created a contest where the community would submit to me their own alternate country ideas. Each viewer would create a country, create a scenario, create a flag, and create a map. Well, I've picked three winners, who submitted countries I most enjoyed. So winners, prepare for your glory, shower, uh, do these countries have to be historically accurate? No, it's for fun. So don't go combing through these scenarios, Jimmy. All the country descriptions are written by the fans themselves, so don't go after me for that. This is Alternate Countries 4. The first country is the Salarian Empire by Samuel Antonio Maeda. In the world of Valorin lies the land of Artesia, home to a plethora of minor nations united under the rule of the country Salaria. People led by the sun is the motto of the Salarian Empire, said in this language a mix of Latin, Spanish, and Italian. And though there are as many dialects as there are nations, the statement holds true to a people who are united sharing a single conviction. This shared view was not always the case in the so-called Empire of the Sun. For nearly 300 years, the Empire has gone through many wars of expansion and losses, of near destruction of its rule and nation, as well as also a complete restoration of it. There are nine nations on the continent of Artesia, eight of which are considered minor states under the might of the Salarian Empire. Gretia, a maritime land, stuck in its classical past and architecture, a fast supplier of ships and fish. Otsgurg, a state of mountainous regions and valleys, where some mining is done, though most of its populace specializes in animal husbandry, especially horses. A more Enlightenment-era type of state filled with music. Romelia, the de facto capital state of the Empire, simply for its central strategic location. It's known for its cultural influence, and an endless supply of workers, builders, and craftsmen. It's a melting pot, currently chosen to be the capital of the realm. It's not so different as how we see Renaissance Italy today. Gurlander where a mighty empire once ruled, before fighting itself into ruin and being conquered by the Salarians. It's home to one of the richest mining areas in the world, with precious metals like diamonds, rubies, gold, and sapphires. Because of its history of inner conflict, it resembles a feudal land of sorts. Isvenia is an adventurous land of grains and fruit. It focuses on cattle. Its people are more openly friendly to other cultures, even if they had intentions in the past to expand into other lands. Such was the case when they were first to encounter Solaria, and their illusions of maintaining an empire were entirely crushed. Farsinia is another state said to have the most fertile lands on the continent. The agricultural giant of the empire, it's a Baroque type of realm, fascinated by anything related to beauty, which its people try to collect in all sorts of ways. Portilia is a coastal maritime state, once called a trade kingdom, a title worthy of its standing in sea commerce. Belden, at the northern edge of the continent, is isolationist. Its isolation proved a testing ground for innovation. The outcome turned them into the tech masters of the continent, with a large empire abroad. Which leads us to Salaria, and its ruler who reunited, restored, and is currently rebuilding the empire. Salaria is called the land of gold, iron, and blood. Its rich lands were innovative, but remote, till the Svenians encountered them. And so began a change for the pursuit of more gold, iron for weapons, and tech, as well as people to rule over. The second country is from Danny Barata Sobro, Gothia. The first turning point for Gothia was the Battle of Ulay in 507. The Visigoths fought against the Franks. With the help of Burgundy and the Ostrogoths, the war turned into a white peace. Alaric II and his son survived. The 530s brought many changes. The popes, as well as the Senate, feared Justinian II and saw him as a threat. Alaric II understood this, and tried to use the Pope and the Senate in his favor. Alaric tried to adapt Catholicism to win the Pope and the Latin majority in both kingdoms for himself. Around 550s to 570s, the unified kingdom of Gothia conquered almost all of Iberia. The new Gothic king would be officially proclaimed emperor. Thus, the Gothia Almalinian Empire was born. 
In the 590s, Gothia participated in a war against Byzantium, which made them the dominant power in the Western Mediterranean. The Almalinian Empire made considerable improvements in warfare technology. During the Arab invasions, which were much smaller than in our timeline, they were able to repel them by the use of Greek fire. From the 680s towards to the 700s, they took more or less indirect control of Northern Africa. They promised to protect the Exarchate of Africa from the Arabs. The Vikings in the north didn't bother with the empire too much. The Gothic marine could handle them with ease, as they continuously improved Greek fire methods on sea. Despite their stable situation, their army was never neglected as it was the duty of almost every subject to be a good soldier. Cavalry was largely used, which helped them to fend off the Hungarians and spontaneous Arab mercenaries, or even the Mongols from their empire. The third and final country is a little odd, but I thought it was interesting. The Kingdom of Therapoda by Bajoran Selen. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived in the jungles of today's Argentina, they were warned by the native tribes not to venture further into the jungle, for there was the home of the wrathful gods. The conquistadors, being used to the superstition of the Native Americans, ventured forward into the jungle without any hesitation. At dusk later that day, only a handful of soldiers that went into the jungle came back, and their testimony described giant feather-covered monsters that devoured their comrades whole. This part of the world turned out to be the last remaining patch of land still occupied by dinosaurs. The native people had been using the herbivores, for example Triceratops, as livestock and for riding, while the carnivores, such as Tyrannosaurus rex and Utah raptor, were considered divine beings that roamed the woods. As more and more people began to abandon their old beliefs, the inhabitants started to take advantage of the carnivorous dinosaurs, using them as means of weapons, and together with the Industrial Revolution, the region of Therapoda became the most rebellious. During the independence revolutions of the early 19th century, the people of Therapoda were the first of the South American countries to break free. The country established a constitutional monarchy that covered much of today's Argentina and Uruguay. Since their independence in 1809, they became isolationist, and to this day still has a suspicion of foreign nations. Since the Spanish couldn't further venture into the land, the later kingdom of Therapoda would come to be a country with a large portion of Native Americans, the largest proportion in South America today. Well, those were the three finalists. Honestly, I wish I could put more, but simply due to the sheer size of this channel now, for comparison, the first alternate countries was to celebrate 2,000 subscribers, I can't include everyone, but I will continue to post other alternate countries on my Twitter, at AltHistoryHub. Oh yeah, one more thing, I have a second channel, called Knowledge Hub, an entire channel dedicated to content that is not alternate history. Pretty much I can talk about anything I want, and I do, from why the Fourth Crusade was one of the worst things ever, to the history of zeppelins and early tanks. I even do videos about flags and countries. If you want to hear more of my voice, and hopefully you do, then check out this second channel that I frequently update. This is Cody of Alternate History Hub and Knowledge Hub.